Deborah Ashell is stabbed 57 times and dies in her own bed. Her grieving, blood-drenched husband, Gilbert, agrees to be interviewed the night of the murder. But a shocking confrontation occurs when Gilbert's babysitter forces her way into the interrogation room and attacks him with a strawberry smoothie. <coughs> It's never taken me more than five hours to solve a case, so the panic was starting to set in. I'd already spent my last paycheck. I had to keep my job. And to do that, we had to bring Deborah's killer to justice, which was priority two. It was a great excuse not to go home and get yelled at by my wife, but if we failed and I lost this job, I'd be stuck at home full time. Unless, of course, my wife divorced me, in which case I'd have nowhere to live, so I'd only be happy for the three or four days before I died of exposure. So we got right to work and spoke to Gilbert's university colleagues. Turns out Deborah's husband was a total woman eater. He was having an affair with his babysitter, with one of his university students, and with his yoga instructor. Yes, they were all the same person, so it was just the one affair. But three different working relationships were violated. 22-year-old Bambi was a triple threat to Gilbert's lonesome loins. You know, balancing my responsibilities as a babysitter, a student, a yoga instructor, and a side piece made for like a super complicated time in my life. Luckily, balance is one of my main strengths, being as I am a highly sought after sexual partner. Oh, and a yoga instructor, which also requires balance. I know what I did was wrong, but in my defense, she lied to me about her age. She told me she was 18. And that's what initially attracted me to her, the idea of coupling with someone so far out of my age bracket. There had to be a legitimate reason why Gilbert was having this affair. We needed to delve deeper into the life and times of Deborah. See, that's something they don't tell you. If you die under suspicious circumstances, all your personal belongings become our reading and viewing material. So if you think there's a good chance someone's going to kill you, delete your nude selfies. Or don't. After hours of searching, the detectives unearth a treasure trove of information, personal videos revealing that life in the Ashell household was not the conflict-free paradise of your typical marriage. Unearthed. They clicked on Deborah's Instagram reels. Let's settle down. Hey guys, Debbie here again, just relaxing by the pool with my two kids and our new pool maintenance professional on deck. Say hello, Bo. <laughs> he came highly recommended by the neighbours and I have to say no complaints so far. Ah! What the? Girl, what are you doing? Sorry, honey, must have screwed up my aim. Oh, well, it won't be the first thing you've screwed up. is that if you leave out the salad dressing, it will keep for two to three days. Ow! My God, Gil. What's the knife doing in the Tupperware drawer? I'm bleeding, you idiot! I'm gonna kill you. I told you 57 times never to do this. Me up, Not now, Millicent. How are we gonna fix this, Gilbert? How are we gonna fix what you've done? Don't worry, honey. The next time I use that knife, I won't be putting it into that drawer. And of course, that knife didn't turn up in the property search. You gotta wonder why she posted some of those videos? I think a lot of them could have used a second take. Okay, it looked bad, but since when does someone's Insta accurately reflect their real life? Mine has pictures of me smiling at my wedding. We had to talk to the people who knew them best. Gilbert's parents had died in a suspicious house fire when he was 17, and that's when he inherited the majority of his wealth before he met Deborah. So that left us with Deborah's family. Deborah's maiden name was Royce, which you may recognise. Didn't click for me until we were knocking on their drawbridge. I knew I wasn't doing well, monetarily, 
But the Royces make rich people look poor. They're like the 1% of the 1%. We visited them in their mansion, which contains 50 bedrooms, a bowling alley, a helicopter pad, a football stadium and a private McDonald's. Luckily, we didn't have to travel far as it was only three doors down from the Ashell residence. We bought just after they did. We wanted to stay close to our son-in-law. To our daughter? Well, obviously, Arthur. She lives there too. Lived there. As Deborah's only living parents, no amount of obscene wealth can assuage the grief of such a net loss. They were such a beautiful couple. He was such a generous, adventurous husband, <laughs> always whisking her away to exotic locales whenever he could. And we paid for it all. But we weren't the ones whisking Arthur. He whisked her. We should whisk me when I was still young enough to be whisked. Deborah's only sibling, however, harboured a fierce distrust of her sister's husband. I never knew what she saw in him, to be perfectly honest. When they met, he was only worth about $3 million. I asked her straight out, why do you think you don't deserve happiness? So the affair came as no surprise, although I only found out about it after she died. No one knew about Gilby and I. We were always super careful. There was only this one time when his son got home early one night and he may have heard us. But gosh, I hope not. That would be just awful. No child should have to hear their parent experiencing pleasure. Deborah wouldn't know about the affair unless she walked in on them or someone sat her down and told her. I mean, she loved Gilbert, but she didn't pay any attention to him. <sighs> He married for the money. If I could have my time again. The Royce family fortune is a relatively recent thing. New money, as they say. <laughs> Our grandfather invented sidewalks. These are some of my father's original designs. He always said, the right idea at the right time could change the number of islands you own. Seems like the only struggle Deborah had her entire life was the one that immediately preceded her fatal stabbing. I didn't have a colour TV until I was 25. And even then it didn't matter because I'm colourblind. So the Royces were richer than Mudcake. And Gilbert married into it, so why would he want to stab the hand that feeds him? He didn't have access. I told Deb when they hooked up, girl, preen up this in the bud and keep your finances separate. And for once she listened to me. <laughs> Separate revenue streams. Well, more like a revenue Amazon River and a revenue IV drip. So we took a closer look at Gilbert's IV drip. An analysis of Gilbert's financial records reveals a destructive, repeating pattern. Oh yeah, apparently Gilbert had a little gambling-ish, but who doesn't? I bet 20 bucks half the people on this crew have some sort of gambling ad Actually, Make that 50 bucks for two thirds. Oh, he'd bet on anything. Poker, roulette, car racing, horse racing, RuPaul's drag racing. <laughs> oh yes, Gil loved to win at gambling. <laughs> so why didn't he? Arthur! Word around town was that Gilbert was so bad at gambling, he'd roll a pair of dice and they'd come up zero. I just needed to win big one time and all my losses would be canceled out, which probably sounds exactly like something a degenerate gambler would say, but I wouldn't know. And it wasn't even limited to sports betting. He'd invest crazy sums into these ridiculous engineering projects. The guy teaches fourth century North Macedonian poetry and he thinks he's going to invent the next sidewalk? All it takes is one solid idea to hit and I had dozens. They didn't hit, but they were solid ideas. Damp alarms, like smoke alarms, but for dampness. $90,000 investment, no return. Microwave fridges, a radio that tells the time. Some of these things have already been invented. A microwave fridge is genius. Instead of opening the fridge, taking the meal out of the fridge, closing the fridge, opening the microwave, putting the meal in the microwave, closing the microwave, you just set the fridge to microwave. You save yourself like 10 minutes every meal. The point is, Deborah was paying for everything. Food, utilities, the pool boy. Gilbert was essentially broke and owing huge amounts of money to some very dangerous people. They'd already taken two and a half of his fingers. What was next on the chopping block? Probably the rest of his fingers. 
The dean of the university told me over dinner one night that they were gonna fire Gilby because of all the bookies that kept calling for him. And of course I told Gilby because he had a right to know. And then we found out that 10 minutes before Deborah died, Gilbert emptied the remainder of his bank accounts to take out a life insurance policy on Deborah worth $80 million. At this point, I'm starting to get suspicious. Suspicious that Gilbert is being framed. Everything's pointing at Gilbert. So your average cop would look at Gilbert. But we're not even close to being average cops. We don't look at what's being pointed at. We look at what's being pointed away from. When one first watches the drama that unfolded in Gilbert's interrogation, one assumes Gilbert has done something despicable and Bambi is just this wide-eyed, innocent fawn expressing her abhorrence. But what if she was calculatedly throwing us off the scent when she threw that strawberry blast? Take away the scent of strawberry and what do you smell? Bambi. It's kind of like a bubblegum smell. The detectives decide Bambi is a person of exquisite interest. <clears throat> Bambi, have you seen this note before? No, but it looks like someone went to a lot of trouble to remain anonymous. They did indeed. Detective Spoink employs a proven technique to gain Bambi's trust. I know what it's like to be sick of waiting for a guy to commit to you. I too was once in a relationship with a married man. Wait, what? You never told me that. You said marriage is a sacred bond. I'm just gaining Bambi's trust by telling her a true story about my life. <clears throat> oh. Now I remember. My married guy strung me along too. Said he would leave his wife for me, but he never did. It went on so long that I started to fantasise about knocking her off so we could be together. Oh, I could never do something like that. You mustn't be as strong-willed as I am. How dare you! Are my needs not important? Why did she take precedence? She's his wife. He broke that vow when he put his hands on me! I went deep into character and it worked. She started talking after that. She started talking so Spoink would stop. The detectives learn a disturbing titbite from the week before Deborah's death. Bambi was being hunted. I'd never seen him before, but he was definitely following me down the street. You're a physically attractive woman. Are you sure this guy wasn't just cruising for a schmoozing? No, I'm sure. Also, I don't know what that is. Would you recognise him if you saw him again? Yes, I'm seeing him again tomorrow. What's that? Well, I still owe him the remainder of his fee. What fee? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I should probably explain. I asked Freddy why... His name is Freddy. I asked him why he was following me, and he told me how Deborah had hired him. And then he gave me his card. So after I spoke to Gilby about it, I called him up and hired him to follow Deborah. Bambi leads the detectives to Frederick Smalls, a local amateur black market pharmaceutical distributor with a side racket in private investigation. People say private investigator. I just say investigator. I take my privates out whenever I can because although I pride myself on my discretion, my business is very testimonial driven so I can't afford to be all that. Private. Hi there, I'm Freddy, your personal investigator. If you look over your shoulder and spot me following you down the street, that's because someone you know has hired me to do that. And guess what? You can do the exact same to them because I am solemnly and contractually committed to ignoring all conflicts of interest. You can hire me to tell your cheating ass husband or your cheating ass wife. Obviously, I'm talking to two different people here. I wouldn't expect one person to have both a husband and a wife cheating on them. I wouldn't expect one person to have both a husband and a wife. That would be very atypical, even by today's... Oh, God damn it! My 30 seconds is up! What if your fridge was a microwave? Deborah wasn't after confirmation. I think she already knew. Seemed to me like she didn't care. No, she wanted evidence of Gilbert's adultery because she was prepping for a divorce. The guy stood to lose a fortune and he wasn't gonna take it lying down. 
Deborah was digging for dirt on Gilby, so I got Freddy to dig for dirt on Deborah. Seemed only fair. And when I dig, I always find dirt. Actually, most people find dirt when they dig. That's a terrible metaphor. Freddy offers the investigation a series of photographs he never got the chance to deliver to Bambi. Captured the day of Deborah's murder. Photographs that suggest that Deborah had a relationship with her pool boy that went beyond the professional. Disgraceful. How could anyone cheat on Gilbo? In the next episode of Untrue Crime, Hogman and Spoink dive headfirst into the bubbling vortex of Deborah's wet and wild flirtation with flotation. Gotta make this quick. The ladies are waiting. And is there a third member of the Ashall family living a double life? Yes, it's the son, Lane.